This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Sunset Safari. My name is Kholi, and joining us behind the camera is Zeb from Gabor. Ah, for any questions and comments, please send them to Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or YouTube chat stream. So we are coming to you live from the western flanks of the Kruger National Park in South Africa. Yes, in a beautiful reserve called Juma. So the weather is great today. It's 31 degrees Celsius. That's about 88 degrees Fahrenheit. So my plan for today is to bumble around. Because I've, uh, I had plans the whole of last week and uh, beginning of this week, uh, I wanted to see Hokumori, but I was unsuccessful. So I will be bumbling around, hopefully Tandi, Talamba, Hokumori, Shidulu, just show themselves to us. I'm driving to the north now. I'll be looking for tracks or any signs because uh, there was nothing, no cat this morning. And I'll be listening to the game drive radio, who knows? We'll hear some exciting news. Um, I have my water bottle here. It's a little bit hot. And obviously my facial froth. So remember, I'm not alone in this drive. There's Ben on the other side of the reserve looking for something special. So let's go to Ben and say hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. My name is Ben. On camera, I've got Craig, and we are out in the wilds of Juma, as always, looking to see what we can find. And what we've actually managed to get for you is a beautiful bird, a lilac-breasted roller. And just check this camera's amazing zoom. There he is, just sitting there. Uh, one of our most beautiful birds, also the national bird of Botswana, as well. Um, difficult to see, let's see if we can get a little bit closer, but you can see all those beautiful colours, the turquoises and the purples and the pinks. And we actually just had a purple roller fly past as well, and the lilac-breasted roller was doing his display, uh, which is where the name comes from. And he was gaining height and then sort of barrel rolling down uh, back towards the surface, flitting left and right, um, how would you say, it's sort of almost like sort of uh, wobbling from left and right and rolling from left and right that's where the name comes from and he actually had a little go at the purple roller and chased him off so obviously feeling a little bit territorial this afternoon it is not breeding season for rollers but they do do their territorial displays throughout the year but there is more of a peak in summer now what I wanted to point out to you guys was these beautiful feathers that it has got um, when he flies you see this incredible sort of electric blue and in a lot of animal or birds out here, we have stunning um, coloration caused by pigment, pigments. The reds and oranges and yellows are caused by something called carotenoids. And then the darker colors are different proportions of melanin, which is more of a blackish color. But this blue is not actually a pigment. It's more of a trick of the light. And it's exactly the same reason that the sky behind the roller is also blue. So basically what's happening is the light is being absorbed by these feathers, by the keratin and some of it is being bounced back and being refracted through air pockets within the feathers and it just so happens that the frequency of light that, uh, that is reflected back from the feathers is the, the frequency that our eyes interpret as blue. So it's actually not an official colour, uh, it's more of a trick of the light. As we know, air has no colour but the sky seems blue, the same is true of the ocean. So rather clever, there's no blue pigment in nature, it's a, what we call a structural colour and why you also have Plasters, if you're working in a kitchen, uh, plasters are blue because there are no blue foods so that you can see if a plaster falls off whilst you're cooking. It's a rather horrible thought. Anyway, I thought it was worth um, sharing that one with you. As far as our plan for this afternoon, well, um, I've decided to give up looking for leopards because I've decided they are all avoiding me and it's becoming rather futile and a little bit embarrassing, to be honest. Um, so I think we're going to rather let them find us. And that... Uh, Often is the best way. I often find the harder you try and do something out here, um, the less fortune you have. And I think we, we tend to pretend we, we can predict these animals' movements too much. Um, and we often end up looking silly. So I'm, Tundi owes me a favour, so I'm hoping also that she's going to pop out in front of the car a little bit later when it cools off. Very, very hot here this afternoon in the low 30s in the Kruger Park. 
So other than that, we are going to head south, and I haven't been to Chitwood Dam for a while, and with it being so hot, and that being our largest area, area of water, I'm hoping we're going to get some activity there, and some nice bird life, and uh, probably spend the latter part of the afternoon down there and hope something interesting comes down for a drink. Okay, just see the bird having a little clean, just making sure his feathers are in good condition. I'm saying he because we saw him doing the display. Well, I'm glad somebody, I didn't catch who it was, but somebody 10 out of 10 uh, for Craig for his camera work on this lilac breasted roller. It, it really is worth having a good look at. Um, it is officially the most photographed bird in Southern Africa. Um, sorry, it was Tom. Tom, thank you for that comment. I've passed on your, your praise to Craig. Oh, right, the roller has left us, so I suppose that is our cue to, to carry on driving. And let's see what else we can find. We've had a sort of a lone in Yala so far this afternoon, but as I said, it is very, very warm. Um, and we think most things are still sheltering under the trees at the moment. We have got a bit of few clouds in the air and hopefully now uh, we will have a little bit of respite from the sun soon as the afternoon ticks on. Yeah, I'm just always, as I said, I'm not looking for Tundi, but if I happen to find her tracks, of course, well, I'm not going to ignore them. So I'm going to keep checking for any evidence. But as I said, very much about the smaller things this afternoon, I think. Okay, well, whilst I continue on my merry little way and see what else I can find to show you this afternoon, I'm going to send you back to Tolly and see what he's got to show you for now. Yes, I'm still bumbling, but I have something on my left there. Very pretty. So, Seb spotted this well spotted Seb. So, we saw a, uh, a fresh track of a male lion. So, we. We thought of going to, to check where is it going and heading because uh, those lines they've crossed on the... Oh, here it go. Oh, I was still talking. Oh, this looks like a... Uh, a warbeck, if I'm mistaken, because I didn't see that bit of prey, but it is, it is a bit of prey. Hey, let me get a nice view again. Oh, please sit. Yes, I think this is a wall box. It's a flying cross, but when it turns, you can see it opens its tail wider. So that's when it's confusing. But when it's just uh, flying on a straight line, the tail uh, makes this rectangular shape. <sighs> so those tracks in the morning, they cut at... Uh, Northwest corner, so and this very same track is, is, is heading to the northwest corner. So I'll check whether it's uh, it's that male that was uh, left behind or what. Hopefully, we'll see a male lion this afternoon. Who knows? An avoca male. So you can see the way it's flying, it's just uh, searching and searching for any opportunity to get a male. And this big bird, you can see the way it's, uh, it's gliding, saving energy and using the thermal. And these big birds, you know, they don't like, really like uh, flapping their wings. Seb, yeah. let's proceed. Yeah, because the, the track looked promising, hey? It was on top of those... Uh, uh, lions in the morning, so hopefully we'll we'll get to said. Gabriel, yes, it really flies like a kite. Uh, we we do find uh, kites in this place. Uh, this kite, you, I I think you you guys have seen that before. A black shouldered kite. The way it flies, it it will it will just fly and flap the, its wings the same spot looking for rodents or any small birds but that one is not a kite you can see the size is huge kites are normally smaller than the, the size of that uh, bird so I'm in the border here northern boundary which is called Bethel's Hook I'm heading to towards the western direction 
because I will need, really need to see where those tracks are heading. Because you now, if it gets warmer and warmer, lines tend to be in a shade to, to lie there and slip. And then they will start moving when it gets cooler. Around this time of the day, you know, there's nothing much happening because it's very hot during the day. Who knows, maybe we'll see a snake. A uh, day before, I was on drive, on a safari, uh, sunrise, uh, sunset safari drive. After, after, after the end of the show, two minutes, we saw a puff adder with Seb. A big puff adder, but if you are, you are on my, uh, you're my friend on Instagram, I've, I've posted the short video there of that puff adder. It was great to see such a snake. And yes, I forgot to tell you, we, we, we have something like a competition with uh, Ben. <laughs> so me and Ben, we were talking just right after the morning meeting this morning. What happened was we, we said we were going to have a competition uh, competing, uh, doing bread calls. So Ben said, he wants to challenge me, or he's challenging me uh, with bad calls. So I don't know, we have to start this now, or I will hear from him during the, the show. So here's a junction here, I have to search for tracks. Yeah, here's a track here. Ooh. Let me see. The track is there. I don't know whether you see it. This step. I think the light is bad, eh? Yeah. Uh, let me go on the side. Go more left. I have a track here. It's a male track there. You see it, sir? Yeah. Let me go a little bit and show you this track. Oh. My lucky socks. <laughs> he has a track here. Stand this side. You can see it's facing straight west. It's one, two, second, third, fourth, two. We have the lobes here. One, two, three. And it's fresh. It's on top of the morning tracks. Huh. Let's proceed. Huh. Tracking. Oh, it really, it, it really, it's really tiring when it's hot like this. But we, we won't back down. We're coming for you, lion. So you must check carefully because it's, it's quite thick. And these guys, you know, they can camouflage very well. Gizmo wants to know what's the biggest snake in Juma. Gizmo, the biggest snake in Juma, it's uh, an African rock python. It's the biggest snake. I haven't seen one since I came here, but I've seen the tracks of uh, an African rock python. It's a constrictor. It's not a venomous snake. It grows up to four, four and a half, five meters. I've seen four and a half uh, meters at, at, at my place. And they, they can even grow bigger than that. Oh, tracks are all over the place here, the tracks. For these lines in the morning, and I'm still, I'm still following that one, male one, which is on top of these ones.
<laughs> All the viewers, they love my socks. Thank you, thank you. You know I'm, I'm wearing these the socks. Shark socks. Sepp, can you, can you get that? Yeah. yeah, shark. You can see I have a great white shark here. Because I'm... Shark will be feeding on these ticks when, they, when they're trying to... It's not the one you find in the sea, great white. This one is my great white you find in the wild. Ah, there's nothing, eh? So what do you think? Will we just competition of the bird calls? Me or Ben? Because Ben is quite good, hey, with his bird calls. Fresh track of a male lion. Let's go to Ben. Probably he will tell you about his bed calls. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Well, we are still also bumbling around, much like uh, Oli. I think we're both looking forward to a nice, relaxing drive this afternoon and seeing what we can find. Um, but I actually wanted to share with you a little story that happened last night because it was a nice poignant reminder to everybody to pay attention out here. Um, those of you who've been watching a little while might know that I've got a particular interest in the stars. So I went out last night with Louise, one of our production ladies, just up onto quarantine where it's nice and open, set up the tripod and We were sitting up there well, about 20 minutes in, just enjoying the quiet and the view. We had a, an impala snort three or four times, and we thought, well, was it rutting, rutting noise? No, don't think so. We better just double check. So we hopped back onto the car and just shined around with the torches. And just as well we did, because about, I would think, 30 seconds later, five lions from the Nkuhumo Pride walked behind our car from about 50 meters away. So we had a bit of a narrow escape last night, although there was no aggression from, from the, uh, the lions, of course. They were quite happily hunting impala and wildebeest on those open plains on quarantine, but it was a, a timely reminder to listen to your surroundings at all times. That's not the first time I've had an incident whilst trying to photograph some stars out in the bush. I remember a couple of years ago, I also heard something and just turned on my uh, turned on my torch to check and I was staring back at a black rhino who was about 50 meters away from me probably wondering what on earth I was doing lying on the floor. So you never know what is going to happen um, but we had a narrow escape and then we watched them for a little bit but uh, I'm personally in, in the firm belief that outside of game drive times that that is now the animals time to move around and they are so gracious to allow us to watch them during the daytime that I feel that we should give them some peace and quiet. <gasps> guys, look what's in front. Look, 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 look. Uh, Tolly, I know you had something to show the guys, but I'm afraid I think I'm going to take precedence because I have just stumbled across gold at the side of the road and I'm just going to get into position and you guys have joined me just at the right time. What an absolute treat i don't know if you can see it and look at that look at that look 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 back so we have found you some dogs i have not seen wild dogs for such a long time i had the other night we just had the uh, tail end of them uh, shooting across cheetah cut line in front of us but it seems they are back they are on our boundary um, so the right hand side as you're looking at them where they're lying in the shade is actually uh, Buffles Hook where we cannot cross onto so they're right on the boundary at the moment but what an absolute treat um, I would love to tell you about this particular pack but I know we've had two packs here and I'm afraid I don't know these animals very well so if any of you eagle-eyed viewers can tell me anything about this pack of dogs I would be fascinated to learn more you can use hashtag safari live on twitter or use the live stream on the youtube chat channel but let's just enjoy these incredible predators for a moment what an absolute treat They are 
told you guys, you go out there with the intention of not looking for the big and the hairies. And we thought, no, I'm going to go and do some nice birds. And then, boom, what do you get? You get a pack of wild dogs as a roadblock. Life is tough sometimes, eh? Excuse me a moment, viewers. I'm just going to call it in on the radio so everybody knows what's happening. Afternoon stations, Slumby uh, of Madutch, static on um, Buffalo Cut Line, it's quite close to, I would think, quite close to Tem uh, uh, east of Tamburti Dam, uh, between Tamburti Dam and Buffalo Dam on the, on the northern cut line. What an absolute treat. I honestly think the last time I saw, had a proper sighting of dogs like this, I'm probably going back, oh, probably about two years. And we get very excited when we see dogs. Uh, I used to work at a training provider, uh, training guides how to, to do this sort of job. I remember the very first drive we went out and on the reserve I was working, we weren't even supposed to have dogs, but dogs have got such a massive area that they operate in that it's very difficult to keep them out of reserves. Um, and these ones had obviously found a hole in the fence and we were driving along, I was on the tracker seat, one of my colleagues was driving and I stopped him because I thought I saw a hyena run across the road, checked with my binoculars and it turned out to be dogs and I got so excited I basically fell off the tracker seat. Uh, which the students thought was hilarious, but I suppose it translates well that we get very excited about what we do out here, and, and why not when you can drive around the corner and have a little gem like this, or multiple gems, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, there's at least eight, I think, here. I just think, Craig, what if we, if we went forward a little bit, would you be able to see this one closer through there? I'm just going to, I'm just, uh, Puma, are you asking how many we can see? I'm just going to move forward a little bit and see if we can change the angle and get a better view of the group. Obviously, what I don't want to do, because they are on our boundary, it, certainly the last thing I want to do is disturb them and cause them to go um, north from here. Otherwise, then we won't be able to see them properly and we won't be able to follow them. So I'm just trying to slowly maneuver a better view. I've also get the sun in a better position. So we went, oops so we don't have so much glare. Hello. Don't mind me. I am just minding my own business. Okay, well, I still can't quite see, but I can definitely count eight. I think there's another one I can see in the grass, which would make nine. They're rather hard to tell at the moment, those in incredible incredible spot patterns they've got or those those uh, those coats those browns and blacks and fawns and whites they are sort of all sort of merging into one to be honest we could have one sleeping on the other one's belly awesome Beautiful sight, eh? This one. Get this one closest to us. As I think that looks like drool hanging out of his mouth, which is rather pretty. I'm just going to try and find my binoculars so I can have a closer look at them. They don't look particularly fat yet. Uh, sorry, viewers, I'm just having a quick chat with Murray back at, uh, in the, in the uh, studio there. Uh, yes, Murray, we can do an unscheduled broadcast. Um, I'm sure I can introduce new people. I think the more people that we can s get to view this, the better. I've just got another vehicle pulling in now. So I think maybe let's just make sure they don't get disturbed. Oh, it's very considerate of them, just moved off the road. But it doesn't look like they're particularly fat. <laughs> Stunning. Uh, 
Barbie asking about whether the dogs have a smell. Well, yes, very much so. Uh, dogs are quite pungent. They're quite similar to hyenas in that regard. They have a very distinctive smell. It's, I suppose it's a bit like if you've got a dog at home, if it's had a, it's been swimming in the, the lake or something, and you get that sort of wet dog or that wet clothes type smell. Um, very pungent and because it's a very much a social animal it's a family orientated social structure they will all have their own unique scent and that will be one of the ways that they'll be able to uh, recognize individuals from their own pack versus individuals from other packs if they were to come into contact with one another so yes sir uh, I can't smell them at the moment but the wind isn't exactly in our favor it's swirling quite a lot at the moment uh, but yes a very distinctive smell you can't miss it when you're when you're close to them Well, looking at that belly, maybe they have eaten, but it is quite normal if they have eaten. After all, dogs have a very, very fast metabolism, um, and it's unfortunately one of... <sighs> yeah, I've just got a whiff of them there. Um, a fast metabolism, and it's one of the, uh, the reasons why, unfortunately, they are struggling in terms of numbers. I think struggling is a bit of an understatement in, in dire straits in terms of the species. Um, and uh, unfortunately, a lot of that stems from human-animal conflict and... Uh, Farmers who are protecting their livestock and protecting uh, their way of life. And uh, yes, unfortunately, quite a few of them have been killed over the years. But we do still have a, a population of a few hundred in the Kruger area. Uh, and of course, with the amount of exposure that they get being critically endangered, you know, there are lots and lots of conservation initiatives in place to, to try and look after these, these guys. And hopefully we can keep the species hanging around for as, uh, as long as possible or even bring them back and increase their numbers. <laughs> very, very nice. You can see they're just enjoying the, the, the shade at the moment. They'll be active a little bit later, I would hope, once it cools off. Understood, copy that, thanks, Murray. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Safari Live and for joining us at this incredibly special moment. My name's Ben. On camera, we've got Craig, and we've just embarked on our sunset safari this afternoon, and I was in the middle of telling a story about how you never know what's going to happen and how I was out taking photos last night uh, of the stars, which we had to abandon because, thanks to a couple of impala that alerted us to their presence, we checked the lights to find some lions walking close by, and I was just in the middle of sort of telling people how you never know what happens, you need to pay attention to your surroundings not thinking we were going to see anything this afternoon for the first hour or so because it's so hot and then driving down the road and voila we come across this pack of wild dogs lying basically on the road when we got to them they're in the shade of this nice big jackalbury and termite mound next to them um, and well to be honest I'm, I'm struggling for for words because it's not every day you get to see wild dogs uh, and we're the only people here so we've got this incredible intimate moment of the pack lying up uh, they are breathing quite heavily. I was uh, speculating just before the, the rest of you arrived to join us that maybe they haven't eaten recently, but now I can see them a little bit better. They do have quite rotund bellies, um, despite their very, very fast metabolism. Um, but a pack of dogs this size, I think we've got eight or nine dogs here by the look of it. I haven't been able to get an accurate figure yet on the numbers. Um, that they can eat a pack of this size could easily be killing and... Uh, eating perhaps up to three impalas every day so they do have a, uh, a quite a big impact on the population of herbivores around them and that's one of the reasons they have such a large area that they roam in it's quite possible to have hundreds maybe 500 square kilometers for one pack to utilize otherwise if we had them all in one place they would completely decimate the the general game in that area they are such efficient hunters that pretty much when they put their mind to it and when you're in the targets or when you are the target of, uh, of dogs and you're a little antelope, your chances of getting away are very slim. Uh, some studies have even suggested that 
up to about 90% of their hunts are successful. Whereas you look at lions and things, and we're down in probably in around the 30%. So lions have this reputation of being incredible predators. But, uh, but these guys are absolutely... Oh, and flop over. These guys are top of the pops in terms of uh, their hunting abilities. And what an absolute treat it is to see them today. Uh, so you're asking if they're related to the to the dogs in India. I, I'm sorry, I know the ones you mean, but I can't pronounce it, and I don't want to look silly on air trying to. Um, but yes, they are related. They're in the same family. I have to say, I don't know too much about those ones uh, specifically, but they are canines and in the Canidae family, so separate from the, the felines, the felidae, the, the, the true cats, um, and of course the hyenas, which are in their own separate family, the hyenidae family. But these are officially dogs, so genetically speaking, they're not too different from the domestic dogs that you have at home. And those, uh, if we can call them sort of wild dogs that, that roam around in India, I, as I said, I'm afraid I know nothing about them specifically, but I would assume that they are very, very closely related. Out here, their closest relatives are probably the jackals. We've got the side-striped jackals and the black-back jackals that we can find here. And then even though they don't occur in this area, the bat-eared foxes. Uh, it says you ask if they're aggressive hunters. Well, I suppose that def depends on your definition of aggressive. Successful, absolutely. Um, and they do have a, a fairly, well, not exactly unique method of hunting, but very different from the cats, which are sort of stalking animals. They'll walk and stalk and, and spring the trap from, you know, a matter of maybe sort of 10 or 20 or 30 meters maximum. Dogs, because of their stamina, they are designed for, for speed and endurance. So a bit more like a marathon runner as opposed to a cat with those big, heavy muscles that it's got to carry around as a sprinter. Think of a, the build of a 100-meter sprinter versus a 1,500-meter runner, for example. Very, very different build. Um, and so they specialize in pretty much locking onto a target and they just chase it down and they work as a team. When one gets tired, the next one takes over. We're not sure whether there is a, a sort of a coordinated attack pattern that every dog has its own rule. It looks like it's probably a bit of a free for all, but they work together very effectively and they separate an individual and they chase it. And because of their ability to just to run at a decent speed, probably you know, 50 kilometers an hour or so for minutes and minutes and minutes on end, um, the poor antelope that's being chased just ultimately gets tired and exhausted and starts to slow down and then the dogs are sort of nipping at it and they're taking little chunks off and the, this poor antelope now is bleeding, it's stressed, it's getting exhausted um, and they are just relentless and in the end the dogs just catch up and the animal kind of just has to has to give up and um, yeah, you know, again, in terms of whether they're aggressive or not, but they, they don't have the strength that something like lion and leopard do to, to attach those jaws around the windpipe and, and cut off the oxygen supply to stop, uh, to stop the, uh, the, the animal from struggling. And so they, and I'm sorry to be so graphic about it, but they basically rip it apart while it's still alive and the animal ultimately dies of shock and blood loss. Now, there was a lot of concern about that, or a lot of negative press, if you could call it, that, you know, these are very um, unpleasant animals because of that. But they've done various studies to show that actually it's probably um, no worse for the prey animal than it is for one of the cats, um, because the adrenaline is pumping and the, the, the shock in the system is there, and they probably don't feel much, and it all happens rather quickly. But, of course, that's easy for us to say as not being the ones disemboweled but um so yes very aggressive and very efficient and voracious in terms of appetite uh, just before we, uh, the other viewers joined us it's telling you they can eat as much as three uh, three impalas a day potentially a pack like this could take out um so they do do a lot of damage. So I had a question from, it sounded like Granny or Tranny or Manny um, about whether one's pregnant. This one closest uh, to us with the belly, you can see that a lot of them do have fat bellies, which leads me to think that they have... Granny, it was Granny. Um, lead me to think that they have probably recently fed, but knowing dogs, it's unsurprising. As I said, they do eat a lot. Um, if one was pregnant, we would generally... General, there's an African grey hornbill squeaking in the background. Um, generally speaking, if we were to see a pregnant or a pack with a pregnant dog, we should really only be seeing one, maybe two, because they have a fairly interesting social structure in terms of that we will have one alpha male and one alpha female, and those are the only two who really do any breeding. The other ones are uh, pups from a previous litter and maybe some immigrant males which have joined, obviously, if otherwise we would never get that genetic diversity. 
So often it's only the alpha female who has pups. There is a beta female as well, and she can also sometimes have pups, but it has been quite regularly recorded that those pups have then been killed by one of the alpha pair. And uh, that female is then used almost as a surrogate mother to ensure that the alpha pair's uh, pups are able to survive. So it's a little bit extreme. And of course, there's exceptions to every rule, but generally speaking, it's just the alpha male and the alpha female that will actually do any mating. So looking at them now, hard to say whether they're pregnant. I don't see on that one. In fact, I'd have to have a look with my binoculars, but I don't see any mammary glands showing. Um, I'm just trying to see. So I'm assuming that that is a boy, but I, even with binoculars, I really can't see the important parts. You see that one's also quite rotund as well. Okay, I think it's, uh, we're gonna have to wrap up this little uh, extra bit of footage we've given you guys. But um, if you've enjoyed this, then please know that you can watch Safari Live on the YouTube channel. You can subscribe to the channel and watch the rest of the Sunset Safari, which will be going on for another couple of hours yet. So thanks very much for joining us and hopefully we'll see you soon. See, they don't look like they are particularly active as of now, but say so if they're nice and full, oh, that one's cocking its leg. Let's have a look and see if we can sex that one. All right, thank you very much, James Richard. This is the Investec Bali Breakaway Pack. And having said that one, that one did just lift up her back legs and urinate, which did show me that in fact, this one is a lady. Uh, thank you for that, James. I'm still learning uh, all the characters here at Juma. I've got ID kits scattered all over my room and downloaded all over my phone. But I have to say, in the excitement of coming across these dogs, I haven't even thought to, to open it yet. Sometimes we spend far too much time looking away from what we're supposed to be looking at rather than just enjoying a sighting, which does not happen every day. But thank you, James. I'll try and commit that to memory. Just going to try and uh, reposition the vehicle again, everyone, so you can get a slightly different perspective. I'm just going to, obviously, I don't want to get any closer to them because, as I said, they are on the boundary road. We, we can't go to actually the side of the road that they're, they're on. So the last thing I want to do is chase them that side. So I'm just going to uh, relocate slightly or move the vehicle slightly just so we can get a different perspective. And I'd like to ensure that we know exactly how many are there because they're sort of in a little depression and I can't see can't see exactly how many but I think uh, James Richards if you can help me out here I think I counted eight or nine before but if you know this pack then maybe you can confirm that one for me hello some girls hello awesome He's really enjoying this shade by a termite mound. Of course, they may use termite mounds, or they do use termite mounds for den sites um, when it is that time of the year for them. But as I said, I can't see any no pups present here that I'm aware of, and I don't see a female at the moment with any mammary glands that are fairly obvious and uh, that she's carrying milk. But they will, just like hyenas, really, they will use old termite mounds for den sites for their pups. And they are very, very attentive family members as i said before it's probably only the alpha pair that mate but all the other dogs are actively involved in the raising of the of the young um, and they regurgitate lots and lots of food to each other so what they'll do is they'll actually sort of beg and it's almost uh, if if another dog begs for food it is expected that you as the one being begged from give food to them so they regurgitate chunks of meat and it's quite normal for one piece of meat to go between three or four different dogs uh, before it's actually digested because it's almost a uh, an instinctual response if something begs be it a, a pup or another clan member or um, a pack member it, you don't really have a choice you just instantly regurgitate your food beautiful Look at the size of those ears 
were picking up sound. All right, well, whilst we stay with the dogs here, I'm sure we're uh, going to sit with them and hopefully they get mobile and we're going to cross fingers that they come south. I'll send you up to the Mara. David is out and let's see what David and, uh, is up to and what's happening in the Mara this afternoon. And Jumbo, everyone, a very warm welcome. Sorry you have been missing in action. But two are here. My name is David and come with me is James. Very excited to have you. We have been caught by a big storm. That's why we have not been in action for quite some time. And we want to show you exactly why we have been away. If in two seconds, James is going to show you some big wall of rain from a distance that has been falling because we already started the long rains in Kenya. And you can see there in the background towards the eastern horizon, a very heavy rain and very thick clouds in the air. My friends already told you as usual, should you have any questions or comments, you may send them through hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. And it's a lovely afternoon, not as hot as it is in Juma, because this is 74 degrees Fahrenheit in the Mara, or 22 degrees Celsius. And I think with the rain, the temperatures are a little bit down. Well, luckily, since morning, we have not had any rains here. But last night, we had a downpour almost uh, the whole night. Now, because the rains have caught me today, I am not sure I'll be able to get to my usual destination, the Sausage Republic. And what I want to do is to look for other lions. The Mara Triangle have so many prides of lions. So I'm thinking possibly today to look for the Owinos or the Mogoros. I would prefer the Owinos for one particular reason. One of the females there was mating, I would say, two weeks, three weeks ago. And not sure by now, we can see how big uh, her belly has changed. And if her belly has started to swell, it would mean chances are she got pregnant. Of course, it could be too early to know whether that happened because uh, it takes about three months, you know, for the gestation period of lionesses. But I'll be happy to know if there's any slight change uh, on her belly. So those are my plans this afternoon uh, to look for uh, either the Mogoros. The Mogoros are always three girls or the Owinos, which are four females and one male, a youngster male. But of course, between this or between now and then, we'll have to bump into elephants, buffaloes, maybe butterflies, trees, a lot, because I can feel or smell. The rain might take some time uh, before it gets to where we are. So we should be fine uh, this afternoon. Not complaining of the rains, because the rains make the whole difference here, especially in the Mara. It has been very dry. The grass got drier, but now with the rains coming, everything has changed for the better. Green, no dust, a lot of fresh air. And we think when the migration will come, everything will be Hakuna Matata. So those are my plans for this afternoon. And tomorrow morning, definitely, I'll be able to get to the sausages. It was very good uh, to have seen uh, the wild dogs, you know. Uh, it's always a very nice pack uh, to watch. And as I head to an area I have not been for quite some time, I uh, will take you to Oli because Oli is looking for a leopard. Right, Oli? Thank you, K David Kitambaki, too. <laughs> I really like the guy, hey. He's one of my favorite guys in the team. So, no luck yet, but I'll be driving in the Muluamati Dry River bed, just on the left-hand side. It's a drainage line. Then I'll be driving there. Hopefully, I'll, I'll find something just lying about, trying to, to relax, something like a leopard. You no know, leopards, they love being around the area because they, it's thick down there and it's, it's cooler. 
Oh. Hello, Boots. We have the crested francolins here. I can't when I get into these grasses. Oh, it's, it's no one thing a bush park in the world, but, but we have one. We have one in the camp, so I would love to see a bush park in this area. So, wish me luck with my lucky socks. But for now, let's go to the guy who's owning the dogs this afternoon. Hello everybody. Well, thank you Molly for your good fortune. I think if you've not had any good fortune, I might have stolen all of it for this afternoon. Uh, those of you who've just joined us, we've still got this pack, amazing pack of wild dogs still uh, lying right next to the road. I thought we were going to lose them for a moment. This is our boundary road. Uh, so where they are lying, we actually is the neighboring property where uh, we're not allowed to go. And we did have a, a rather a bit of traffic come past whilst you're away, but the dogs have been very, very accommodating and uh, have remained where they are, which is great news. If you'll excuse me, I just need to speak on the radio for a moment. Obviously, there's quite a lot of interest uh, with with these dogs around. Uh, Swim, so you're asking about wild dog tax, attacks on humans. Um, not that I know of. Eh? They're generally, I mean, you can see in terms of build compared to lions and leopards, they are a lot less slight. Uh, I'm unaware of um, any attacks on people. I'm sure it probably has happened. One would have to be careful, obviously, when you see them. But I've been fortunate enough to see dogs once on foot, actually, when I was up in Botswana. And we watched them quite happily from about 60, 70 meters away. They knew we were here. But uh, or that when we were there, but they showed no interest in us whatsoever. So um, unaware of, uh, thankfully. But so no, I don't think we need to be too worried about the dogs. But one must always respect um, wild animals, of course. Right, just need to get on the radio. Sorry, guys, you're just going to hear me chatting for a moment. Afternoon station, just an update. This Slummy Madutch is still static on Buffalo Cut Line um, to the east of Tamboti Pans. One in the lock. Copy, you're welcome to approach. Right, sorry about that, everybody. Right, so yes, no no real danger to man, thankfully. So you're welcome to be uh, number three. Uh, actually, you'd like to size reference. Right, okay, uh, I don't know if you know the uh, Belgian Melanoise, which is a, a dog that is used in anti-poaching quite regularly uh, out in these areas. Um, so it's kind of, if you sort of jizz-wise, which is sort of general impression of shape and size, it's a word we use out here. Um, imagine sort of a, a pygmy Alsatian or a pygmy German Shepherd. So in terms, of, I would say sort of shoulder height, maybe a, a large Labrador. But you can see they have a, that sort of German shepherdy Alsatian look about them, but it's by no means quite as large as that. So I would think from um, shoulder height of about maybe 50 centimeters, 60 centimeters, and from rump to, to neck, to give you an idea of the body size, probably around just under one meter or maybe one meter. But I think if you know what a Belgian Melanoise looks like, then uh, that's probably the closest comparison that I could. Uh, that I could draw. Maybe it's just slightly smaller than the melon was. They're not as big and as fearsome as some of the uh, some of the other cats out here. Uh, in terms of body weight, and I have to admit I am checking my my book quickly because I can't remember the specific weight. Let's have a quick look. Uh, let's have a look. About up to about 25 kilograms. Uh, Gizmo, you'd like to know if we had them as pets. No, we don't have them as pets, and that's for more than, well, for the main reason that there just aren't very many of them around. Um, we are, again, I stand to be corrected, of course, because numbers change all the time, but in terms of population in the entire world, we are probably looking at less than 5,000 uh, dogs, maybe a couple of thousand in South Africa, and just in the, the whole Kruger area, which is probably between two and two and a half million square kilometers. We're looking at maybe 200 individuals. That's why this is so special. So they are just not kept as pets. Nothing, I've never heard of anything uh, along those lines. But they do look very much like pet dogs, certainly. Right.
right, everybody. Right, well, whilst we sit with these dogs and we hope they're going to get moving soon and, and hopefully obviously come south onto Juma's property uh, itself, I'm going to send you back over to Molly, who I believe has got a very large animal to show you. Yes, we have a meditating buffalo here. This is a male buffalo because you can see he's alone. And very old buffalo pools that have passed their reproductive peak uh, from 10 years and above, they like staying alone because they don't have uh, much energy to follow the herd. Oh, you can see the guy's calling there, trying to disturb this buffalo and it's busy meditating. You can see it's chewing its cut there. Doesn't want to be disturbed, but this one is busy poking and pecking and making noise. You can see there's a big boy here in the in the horns, the tip of the horns. It's 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 blunt. Oh shame! You can see this guy has been through a lot. He's been fighting all his life with the rival males. Gremlins, how fast do, does this, uh, do these birds fly? It's a red-billed oxpecker. I'm not quite sure. I, uh, I've, been, I've been read about that, but I will, I will, I will ask uh, Ben because he's, uh, he's more advanced when, when it comes to birding. Hopefully he will be able to answer that. But these ones, they live in groups. You can see the, just patching in there. And that skin, you can see it's uh, it's old, very old. And uh, these guys, when they get very old, they will suffer from skin diseases. And sometimes they will they will just uh, lose their fur because of the previous battles. Chewing is cut there. Oh, nice, good-looking yellow teeth there. Mm, chewing cut. Uh, you know, these ones are four-chambered stomach animals and then they will they will feed and feed and feed oh they will feed and feed and feed and feed and then they will sit down and then they will regurgitate and they will chew, reach you again and they swallow oh what happened there maybe lion claw or maybe a male bullhorn that made that you can see that was a very bad wound Ellen, how old do I think this buffalo is? Uh, I will take a guess. I, will, I can say uh, 9, 10 or 11 years because, uh, as I've said, after uh, a reproductive peak, and that's above 10 years, from 10 years and above, then they, they, they form bachelor groups or they, they walk alone. Because these guys, uh, these young mature uh, male buffaloes they they fight them and then the head always is always on the move so these guys don't have power and energy to keep up with the young boys and the herd and this buffalo it's dangerous if i can say that these guys they are born grumpy because uh, buffaloes are one of the animals that uh, they don't give a mock charge they charge. If you want to charge, they charge. They don't back down. You can see the boss there. And this one, this bird, it feeds on blood and ticks. And let me just keep quiet and listen to the sounds and feel and smell all the, the things of the bush. KJ wants to know, does, it, does this bird ever blink? <laughs> Let's check that. Except Let's go and look at this bird eye and see whether it will blink or what. Yeah, it does blink, hey? But it's quick. Oh, look at that. They have these long and sharp and, and strong uh, claws. That's so, so why they can maneuver easily in these buffaloes, on these buffaloes. The big boy and the lions are far from the place I've been uh, found any lion in the property and you know lions they they really like these lone buffaloes because they don't have any backup from the head oh, nice drink there 
And I don't know where they are, this because these these birds you tend to find them with the members of the of the flock. It's nice and quiet out here. That's why he, this boy is called the Daga boy, because we know this is what he's doing. It's in the mud there. And this mud helps uh, the skin. Yeah, beautiful audio. Like nice call from this tiny bird thing. And these birds, when you hear these birds, when you're on a bushwalk, you have to be very alert because uh, you will find these guys in the thicket there. You mustn't at all times not ignore this bird call. Oh, the boss, <clears throat> you can see these horns. They've been through a lot, hey? And sometimes they will wrap them on the ground or in the mud to, to give it a, a nice scratch. very lucky because the Nkuhumas a uh, few days ago they were all over this place I don't know where he was hiding <clears throat> sorry yes some viewers they think uh, the, this thing looks like a big tick on its eye and it's a piece of its skin hey I think maybe it was caused by the lines Maybe it was fighting the lions or it was fighting another buffalo or maybe a thorn because you can see this place is thick and buffaloes they just maneuver everywhere in this place. So maybe a thorn, a vicious thorn, did that damage there. Oh Marine and FC thinks it's a growth. Let's take a look. Uh, so this guy is busy meditating. Hopefully, maybe he will stand up and see what he will be up to. But for now, let's go to Ben, who has his sleeping wild dogs. Hello, everybody. Well, welcome back. We are still sitting here with the uh, Investec and Bali breakaway pack of wild dogs. Um, we're having an amazing size here of them. They're just lying up right next to the road here, as you can see. They look like they've all got full bellies, so that they have eaten recently. Um, but they don't seem to be in any hurry to do anything at the moment. You can see that they're breathing deeply, trying to, to get oxygen into that digestive system to deal with what was probably another impala, although but all of them look quite fat. So it wasn't something small like a Dacre or a Steenbock. You wouldn't see them with su quite such swollen bellies. They might, of course, have picked up uh, something a little larger like a, a young kudu or a young ninyala or maybe a bushbuck we, we don't know uh, just driving down the road and bam there they were in front of us so we've been very very fortunate this afternoon I had a question earlier about whether we thought um, one was pregnant and it's just really just because of the fat belly um, but we are coming into puppy season now for dogs it's usually around sort of May June uh, which is towards the the beginning of winter probably a couple of reasons for that um, number one if uh, I'm sure you those of you who have joined us regularly are aware we've been seeing a lot of impalas doing their rutting behavior at the moment so the, the males fighting for their territories and then they'll hold these territories for the next couple of months in an attempt to attract some uh, impala used to their area so that they can breed with them and pass on their genetics which of course is their big goal in life so at this time of year, all the impalas are set, or all the male impalas anyway, are separated holding their little territories. And those males who were not strong enough to, to sort of win those initial fights have probably ended up with uh, territories which are not so favorable. They're not the, they don't have uh, too much to offer the females. They want to have good areas uh, of, of food, of grazing and browsing. They need to have access to water. 
um, nice open areas so they can look out for danger such as these guys coming around the corner. So the impalas are all rather split up this time of the year or certainly in the next month or two so it probably does make sense that whilst um, the impalas are separated they're a lot easier to catch for dogs you can don't have to worry about uh, the whole herd of impalas fleeing in different directions and confusing you you've got far less eyes watching you sneak up so you might be able to get a little bit closer before you launch the hunt so this is good time of year for the dogs and if you are gestating embryos in your womb as the alpha female then obviously the more food and the more energy you can get into your system to to aid in that development the better um, and then generally of course all predators uh, do very well in the winter months and obviously with the pups being born around uh, May, June, so very much the dead of winter. Uh, it's coming into to peak hunting season for our predators and that's mainly because there's less vegetation around, that is uh, winter here is our dry season uh, and so all the vegetation dies off, there's not as much food around and therefore the prey items that uh, these dogs are going to be after, things like impalas, are uh, struggling to find enough food and therefore they're just that little bit slower and taking a few more risks going towards water holes and things so it's uh, much easier if you're a predator to hunt during the winter than in the summer. But right whilst we wait to see what these guys are up to let's send you up to the Mara and David because I believe he has another predator to show you. That's very true I mean uh, wild dogs uh, with uh, some beautiful weather would be tempted to go hunting. Well, the lions here in the Mara Triangle do not care very much about the weather. They would hunt summer, winter, as much as we do not have very defined weather seasons in Kenya. And this one particular lioness have another sister or another cousin. And the direction they're going, James will show you, there are some buffaloes at a distance. Now just look how green it is. It's beautifully green because this area had fire the other day. So that's the other female I'm talking about. And I've been looking at them carefully. And I'm sure, you know, I tend to specialize with the sausage lions. You see what they're looking at? Thank you, James. So the buffaloes, I'm thinking, they're looking at a distance. It's a huge, massive herd. And I do highly doubt two lionesses can do anything here. But again, you never know. My favorite pride, the sausage tree pride, if it was them, I would like to think, well, something might happen here. So what we want to do, and James is encouraging me, is for us to follow those two lionesses slowly and carefully and find out what they want to do. But intentions of looking for food are there, you can tell from what they're doing. And for now, I have a feeling these two girls would be coming from the Ololola Pride. You all know the Ololola Pride. It's one of the largest pride that we have here in the Mara Triangle. And it was involved in a big battle with another pride that we call the River Pride. So what would happen is, unless we got two, three or other lions somewhere that I cannot see, and then they would combine forces, then that time chances are, they would bring a buffalo down. They'd look maybe for a pregnant female. They would maybe look for an old male. They would look for an injured buffalo. Or they would look for a young calf and then zero in you know zero on in it. But two against a buffalo, I highly doubt. It's very possible. It's very possible. So I want to take a swing here. And James will tell me when you're happy, I'll stop and we'll have a look at them. But I can see all intentions and signs of wanting to get dinner. I mean, no doubt about that. But the only prey I see that's available for them now are buffaloes and not anything else. So James is telling me to keep going. Uh, he knows the best place uh, where he wants to place his camera. So I'm going to drive forward a little bit. Just give me another two minutes so that we can look at these buffaloes. Sorry, James. And I'm crossing a little lager there. Or a pucker move, pucker. Betty, good question. You're wondering how Kinkatel is doing. She is doing fine. I was with her yesterday and the day before, and Kinkatel is doing perfectly well. I just wish Betty watched yesterday in the morning. I was out there, and her wounds have recovered. 
and she looks a different girl. Are you happy, James, there? So, Betty, Kingstel a week ago was struggling even to walk. We've got other friends of ours who have come to the city to watch. These two lionesses here. And Betty, she could not even stand. But as it is now, those two wounds have healed very well and the blood have clotted, there's no bleeding, and you can tell that she is slowly and surely getting her energy back. Now, the good news here, Betty, is we'll get the other females trying to hunt for her. So Kingstail is in good shape and all is doing very well. Now, I just looked carefully and found out that Lioness is actually not looking at the buffaloes. She is concentrating on a pig. She is looking on a watchdog. And that's where she is. James, let me show you. If you turn left the camera slowly and you go there, don't worry, James. I have seen what this female is looking at. Yes, keep looking, James. And if you just zoom in somewhere, and I know you'll get it. Uh, how? Well done, James. I knew you'll get it. That's what exactly this lioness is looking at, not the buffaloes. I was wondering, the buffaloes are quite a distance from where she is, and chances are, she will not start talking, stalking rather, at that point. That was just too far. And my apologies about my head there. I'm sure to watch a lioness stalk is more appealing than seeing my head. And so she keeps looking. I got a feeling this watchhog have not seen this lioness. No. But I'm looking at a whole 300 meters apart. Well, the 200, yeah, let me say 200 meters apart. Chances are she is not going to start running from where she is. She must bridge the gap. And like cheetahs, anything 100 to 300 meters, they'll give a chase. Uh, lions will not do that. At most is 100 meters. I'll be more than happy to cover more ground, uh, Mari, because this lion is showing a lot of intention looking at that warthog. What she'll want to do is to get a tamarind mount and hide herself, and the other sister is looking. Hello, hello, and Jumbo Jumbo, everyone. A very warm welcome to the Mara Triangle in Kenya. My name is David, and on camera with me is James. James, how are you, sir? Now, we've got a very special setting here. We've got two lionesses that are stalking and that are very hungry, and we're gonna take you to those lionesses now because they have shown us all intentions of wanting to hunt. Now, these two, Females, yeah, we have one at the moment, you know, on your screen, but there's another one. If you look carefully, sorry about my head, you see there? There's another one there, there are two of them, and they have shown intentions of wanting to get dinner for themselves. I'm saying dinner because it's about five o'clock in our Kenyan time here. Sorry again about my head, but James have just to keep swinging between the two females because of how they have strategically placed themselves. Now, Ladies and gentlemen, if you look carefully there, there's a pig, and that is a warthog. But behind the warthog, if you look, there's so many other bigger mammals there, and those are African cape buffaloes. Now, chances are, two lionesses, three lionesses, it could be very difficult for them to go for a buffalo. And what they're concentrating on, it is this uh, particular uh, warthog. And what I'm thinking or what I'm feeling this warthog have not seen these females. So what they want to do is to slowly uh, bridge the gap between themselves and the warthog. Now let's look at that one lioness and see her stalking mode. It's very still, very quiet, and the eyes focused on the warthog. She have to be sure that the warthog hasn't spotted them as yet. But as it is, I would say, so far, so good. So she's coming to catch up with the other one, which is about uh, 15, 20 meters ahead of her. And I'm sure they're gonna compare notes and agree this is the way forward. 
As I said earlier, from where we are, I would guess these two females come from a pride of lions that we call the Ololos. So this one just sat down there. And she's still focused on the watchdog because currently uh, the area we are in, if you look carefully, the grass is quite green. It's very green because this area was burnt a few weeks ago by the game rangers on what you call controlled burning. And this was the result of the rain. Fresh shoot, fresh grass. It's lovely, benefiting everybody and more so the herbivores. And now the advantage of that, this particular, excuse me again, lions have, you know, the visibility, it becomes much better for them to spot even smallest prey like the warthogs. They may take time, they are never in a rush. Lions are always very patient because, as I said earlier, they need to bridge the gap between themselves and, and uh, you know, between themselves and the warthog. Jennifer, you're saying, how close can I get to the either lions or the warthogs? Jennifer, one thing's clear. I would want you to get the very best, but I think where I am, I'm about 100 meters away, and I think that is the minimum distance or the maximum distance, or rather let me say, that's the closest I would want to come to them. I would not want to go so close to them, not to interfere with the hunting, so I'll keep a distance and make sure that we are quiet, we're just using the camera, and I keep talking and a bit softly. So I would say 100 meters, we are fine from the lions. And I would say the warthog is about 200 meters, Jennifer, from where we are. And I think for the lions too, that's a good distance for us to keep watching what is going to unfold here. The Mara remains very beautiful. And if you look carefully to the right, there's that huge uh, bosque tree there and the buffaloes on the other side. But Chris, you're right that lions love warthogs. I'll tell you what, between now and maybe the next few months until we get the wildebeest or the migration back in the Mara, with a season that we call the green season, and the lions here have been surviving on warthogs and of course, occasionally buffaloes. Buffalo is a big prey and it's quite a challenge. And you had a question earlier there I think from Betty, uh, who was asking how Kinktail is doing, and I said Kinktail is doing well. And Kinktail picked a very bad injury from a male buffalo that they were hunting 10 days ago. She got two very deep wounds that have since recovered, I would say. And even this lioness is here, I know very well they do not want to take any chances or play games with their buffaloes. I'm counting about 100 plus buffaloes from where I am. James, do you want us to look at those buffaloes from a distance there? Thank you for that. But we'll see the buffaloes much later. But we've got 100 plus buffaloes. But these two lionesses are not bothered at all because they know the dangers of trying to hunt such a huge animal. Look at them there. Loads and loads of them. It's a big number, but they will not even take chances to go in that direction because they know they can easily pick some damage. So what they want to do is to stay here and keep looking. And Mina, good question. As you go back to those uh, lionesses, Mina, you'd like to know whether, I mean, these lionesses only hunt wildebeest during migration. No, Mina, apart from, my, apart from the wildebeest, they also hunt zebras. And those are the two main animals, the two main prey they'll hunt during the migration. They'll hunt wildebeest and zebras. They always have a choice. I mean, Mina, looking at the migration, will always have a huge number of wildebeest, sometimes up to a million and a half of wildebeest, you can imagine, and maybe about 800,000 uh, zebras. So they would hunt both. Of course, Mina, depending on the situation and depending on what is available. Now look at carefully what you'd call a hunting mode. Of course, you want to know how far are the lions or the lionesses from the warthog. Initially, it was about 200 meters. And I tell you now, it's about 100 meters. It's 100 meters. And both of them are going, not really laying an ambush. I think they want to get as close as possible and then just sprint. 
And also in the background there, James, there's a zebras. And I'm thinking, yes, there's zebras there, which are fine. But either way, these lions are not interested, not in the buffaloes or the zebras. Slowly and surely gaining ground, getting closer and closer. So what they will need to do is to take cover of any sort, be it a tamarind mound, be it a bush, be it a small little drainage, be it kind of a gully. Ashe, good question, and you're asking if hyenas do interfere with the lions hunting. Not at all. Ashe, I'll tell you, lions and hyenas are two predators that are natural enemies. They don't like each other, they do not tolerate each other. If anything, they would really be happy or encourage the, you know, they just really be happy and wait for them to hunt. And after they hunt, definitely they know they would benefit. So I want to make a little angle here and turn backwards and see whether we can uh, reposition ourselves so that uh, we do not interfere with hunt and also give James a very good angle. Of, are you happy there, James? Keep coming. Okay, James says that's not a bad angle. So that we also have other friends of ours. We do not block their way and everybody have a chance to see what is happening. There she goes. And the moment you see her starting to crouch down, we'll now say it's time to go for the run. But as it is now, it's very slowly, very carefully. Let's just keep waiting. Very good. I'm just confirming with my friends that they have pretty good view so that we also don't uh, block them. We've got so many visitors traveling all over the world and we just want to make sure everybody benefits from this special. So we can't see the, what the, the, the pig as yet and I'm sure this lioness can see it. Either she's feeding somewhere in a small little barrel, that's my guess. Ragna, how are you today? And you're saying you've never seen anything like this. But James, if you look carefully, the water is just there on the run. And unfortunately, she's coming the wrong direction. Yes, this is all what a safari life is about. Thank you, James. And we see this every other few days, if you're lucky. And that's the one thought. Either the pig has picked some wind of some danger here, and she's going now in a different direction. And this lioness have either to be patient. So we just need to watch. Look at the gap between the two. And of course, the further she goes, the chances of this lioness now thinking of it will definitely dwindle. Bob, good question. You're asking whether there are any alarm calls as it is now. It's very quiet. We do not have any birds at the moment. If guinea hens were here, of drongos were here, or the go away birds were here, we could be hearing or some kind of franklings. We could be hearing a lot of alarm calls. But in this grass, when it, it you know, it, the fire went burnt the grass, I would guess the birds do not have much of a choice uh, in terms of feeding availability of food here. So we do not have any alarm calls at the moment. Well, I would say either the warthog have smelled there's some danger and has gone in a different direction. And I think these lions may have to go to the drawing board. Well, ladies and gentlemen, how was that, eh? Almost very close to a kill. This is how things unfold here. I want to thank all of you for having joined and just to remind you, should you want to keep watching, please keep watching on the YouTube. And we're gonna give you one more look at those lionesses there as the rains are coming. And on behalf of myself and James, you may be sending you other notifications in the very near future. Stay alert, many thanks and goodbye.
Very good. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. And that was quite exciting. We have said, well, sorry for the Lionesses. They did not make it uh, to get some dinner for themselves. Well, well the watchdog has survived, has a story, and it has lived another one day. And as you continue to watch what might happen here, I think Ian is still enjoying the sighting of the wild dogs in Juma. Right, well, it sounds like you guys had a pretty special moment up there in the Mara, but those of you rooting for the Warthog, it seems, um, managed to get away from what I can hear from the updates. Uh, these dogs have not really moved since we last saw them, but I have spoken to some of the other guys and I've got a bit more of a backstory as to, as to what they've been up to today. Um, it seems that about only about two hours ago or so, they actually came across a lone lioness who had uh, killed an impala. Uh, and the pack of dogs was able to chase off the lioness and steal her kill. So that's why they look so fat. And so they've only just finished eating. So I think they're probably going to be lying up here for a little while longer, busy digesting. I said earlier that they have a tendency to uh, regurgitate food for any um, pack members who are not here. But now that, and one of the reasons they can do that is when they're active, their digestion sort of doesn't kick in. Um, but now they've become uh, static and they're enjoying a bit of a lie down in the shade, the digestive process will have kicked in and the ability to regurgitate will now be a lot more difficult because those stomach acids have started to do their thing. So that's a, a very nice uh, adaptation that dogs have got in terms because of their very, very active life cycle or lifestyle, sorry, that they can, as long as they keep running, that food doesn't actually start digesting and that allows them to take food back to pups and any other pack members who weren't able to join on the... Uh, weren't actually able to join on the hunt. Um, Gabriella, had you asking uh, the average lifespan of the dogs? Um, if I'm honest, I'm not 100% sure, so I'm going to give you a, a sort of a guess in that it's probably around somewhere between 10 to 15, but that is probably something I should know, so my apologies. Um, but say we don't see them very much, and these sort of standard vital statistics you tend to forget after a while, but I'm assuming somewhere uh, probably 10 to 12 maybe 15 if they're particularly successful but I'll see what I can find out um, next time you guys cut away and I will give you a proper answer then so sorry Gabrielle but I think I'm probably in the right ballpark that's of course if they get to old age as it were because unfortunately they are um, kind of well not quite bottom of the pecking order in terms of the predators out here they'd still happily run off a cheetah from its kill but uh, lions leopards and hyenas obviously much larger and they would tend to dominate a kill site, although the dog's ability to work as a team does work in their advantage. I've seen a pack of dogs chase off sort of three hyenas, but it was probably about seven or eight dogs, and they can work in tandem with each other, and they just harass the hyenas till uh, the hyenas just always sort of give up and say, no, it's not worth it, heading off. Um, but the majority of of dogs are killed and especially uh, over 50 percent I think it's actually over 60 percent of their pups are actually killed by lions that find the den site um, so wherever you've um, got lions and dogs in close proximity to each other um, then it does have an impact on the population of the dogs and, and again one of the reasons that they operate over such a large area they would prefer to be in areas where there isn't a high lion population to uh, give them a better chance of survival <clears throat> and with the way sort of things are and the way these private reserves are going with, with urbanisation and human encroachment uh, it unfortunately is happening a little bit more regularly than it used to now that lions and dogs are coming into more contact um, Shax, you're asking about their den site well, they don't have a, a regular den they're not actually territorial in terms of they don't uh, patrol their boundaries and scent mark like lions do and roar and so they have what we call a home range, which is an area that they will live in. And that might overlap with a neighbouring um, pack of dogs as well. If the two come into contact, obviously there'll probably be a little bit of uh, aggression and the, the bigger pack usually chases off the, the smaller pack. Um, but they don't, because they're not fiercely territorial year round, they don't have a permanent den site and they pretty much sleep where they want, like this. But when it is uh, time to have puppies, which is say, coming up in the next few months, then they were almost a bit like impalas. They'll become seasonally territorial around wherever they choose to make their den site. Um, and that they will defend aggressively from other animals and other members of... Uh, 
parasites move quite regularly uh, because they are quite pungent and they do have a habit of bringing food back to the den to, to feed the pups and uh, maybe to feed the alpha female if she's not yet uh, left the pups to sort of join the adults on the hunt. Um, the area around those den sites does tend to smell quite a lot of dog and that does attract other predators so it's quite normal for dogs to move their den sites sort of every month or so for the first three or four months and by definitely by six months the pups are running with the pack and they're they're on the move again permanently so we don't know if these ones have chosen a den site yet I, I couldn't tell you which one the alpha female is I'm not sure if she is pregnant yet but we would expect bearing in mind they do uh, tend to give us a, a um, I can't think of the right word a, a group of puppies uh, about once a year so hopefully in a few months if we're really lucky we cross fingers maybe they do den somewhere close to here and we can have some regular sightings of them for a, a prolonged period of time which would be incredible <coughs> okay but what i was saying before about them coming into contact with other predators so with um with mankind's spread sort of minimizing the amounts of land or amounts of uh wilderness wilderness areas available to animals such as this um, you know we have to put fences up around things more to protect the animals from people than the people from animals certainly um, and by doing that we've sort of cut off a lot of the areas that these dogs can utilize and that brings them into much more regular contact with larger predators um, and that's why a lot of them unfortunately are getting killed and then those ones that either are not contained with a fence but have got human habitation on the boundaries of those areas um, or they might be able to get through they might be able to get through fences and they end up in farmland where they've got uh, a lot more access to food taking uh, sheep and goats and that's when farmers uh, have to defend their um, their way of life and a lot of dogs are, are killed or poisoned or trapped um, so unfortunately it's rather tricky for them at the moment. Um, Bloom, you want to know how much they eat per day? Well, it's difficult to give you a, a, a proper figure, um, but you can see they're nice and fat now, but they will digest this food very, very quickly. So a pack of this size, uh, their favorite food would be in parlor. I would think it's quite normal uh, for a pack like this to, to be able to kill two, maybe even three in parlors a day. So even though they're probably weighing only around sort of somewhere between 15 to 20 kilograms, maybe 25 kilograms for the largest animals, they're probably eating about four or five kilograms per day on average, if that helps. Lots of tail wagging. Oh, and a big stretch at the back. And look at that big belly. You can see they're, all, they're sort of almost like lions all lying on top of one another, sharing that, uh, that group smell. Oh, you're the closest related domestic dog to a wild dog. Wow, that is a good question. Um, well, the, the proper answer is I have no idea, but looking at them, I would think that they must be fairly closely related to things like German Shepherds and Alsatians. And a little bit earlier, I, I mentioned the Belgian Melanoirs, if you know of that breed, which we use for a lot of anti-poaching patrols out here. Um, quite similar in shape, just maybe a touch smaller than that in terms of build, but uh, very similar in terms of sort of head shape um, and the way that they've been put together. So I would assume it's one of those ones, uh, but I honestly couldn't tell you for sure. There are so many different breeds out there, many of which of course have been, if you like, manipulated by, uh, by man breeding them for specific, uh, for specific roles. Colors are incredible. It's very difficult to pick one from another now. They've all sort of blurred into one with all of those. Oh, there's the one at the back. So there is an eighth one. Just for those of you who were sh weren't sure, we do have eight in total. There's one hanging out at the back. It seems to be a little bit more uh, independent from the other ones. But the other seven here are all sort of lying in one big pile, basically. And I'm just in the shade of this lovely termite mound. Um, but being as fat as they are I don't actually expect them to do much for the next couple of hours but that does not mean we're not going to sit here and you never know what's going to happen. And it's actually quite a pleasure to watch them being still. Um, if you've ever watched wild dogs hunting it's quite 
uh, traumatic for us to try and keep up with them. And David, you're asking whether they hunt at day or night. Generally speaking, they are a diurnal species, so they, they hunt more during the day or uh, late or early morning and late afternoon, which is what we would call crepuscular. So they're sort of crepuscular animals and they're more active dawn and dusk, basically. They, don't, they do move around in the night, of course, at times, but generally speaking, they try not to or they try and avoid it just because that's when their bigger cousins, uh, the lions, the leopards and the hyenas are far more active and uh, being much slighter in build and far less strong. If they come across any of those larger predators, well, not so much leopards, actually. Leopards would, would run from a pack of wild dogs and be chased up a tree, but they certainly don't want to come into contact with lions on the, on the hunt during the evening. If we're so lucky, I'm so chuffed by this. I was saying to you, to you guys before, I'm trying to think back. I think it was a good two years ago that I had a proper sighting of dogs a couple of times and we've had them on the move, but they move so quickly um, that to try and keep up with them when we have to go off road um, is very, very difficult. And I'm sure it's probably happened here and it's happened in many places. We've broken many cars uh, trying to keep up with wild dogs on the hunt because they're so easy to lose. They just go rifling through the bushes like bullets out of a gun and of course we have to go around trees and find roads and avoid thicker areas where they go flying through and they can very easily put one or two kilometers between you and them oh, in just a couple of minutes. So it's quite traumatic trying to keep up with dogs so this is a, a nice chilled uh, wild dog sighting but very exciting to see them on the hunt because of their um, very very high success rate. And they don't hang around. Though. If they do kill something, they eat it very, 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 very quickly. Uh, usually within, if they were to kill an impala, usually within 10 minutes, there's very little left. And that's also a very nice way of avoiding scavengers, because if you eat your food very, very quickly, um, there's no smell given off. And unless the predator kill taking place, um, or happen, and therefore happens to be very, very close proximity chances are that food is entirely finished before any hyena or lion who might have been in the area even gets there so perhaps eating so fast is an adaptation to uh, survive amongst the larger carnivores that are prevalent in Africa Okay, well we're going to sit with the dogs for a little while longer, I'm say not every day we have a chance to do so. So I'm going to send you back down to Holly, who I think is still on the search for Tundi, I believe, so I wish him all the best. Let's see how he's getting on. Huh, I'm still searching. It's not easy, not easy at all. Huh, I drove Luamwati half of it from uh, the middle to the east and then I'll be driving from the middle again to the west. Ha! Huh. Hopefully I'll see a cat here. Low range. Gear number two. I'm in. Muluamati. Oh, it's cool down here. So this is a perfect place for leopards because this area Dry river beds, very cool. So wish me luck. Maybe I'll see a cat, a leopard, Kalamba. Oh, it's been a while not seeing Kalamba, hey? Let's hope she's okay wherever she is. And I'm hoping to see a, a bushbuck. Bushbuck is one of the antelopes we find here, and it loves the thickets. Lioness want, want me to teach you a new word in my language. <laughs> I'm sure that sounds very funny, hey? Umkharizweni. Umkharizweni, it's uh, two sisters or two ladies who are married in one family. They call each other Umkharizweni. Weird. It's like uh, Afrikaans or Dutch language because it's there. Oh. I wish I can 
it's chill here and then a leopard comes here because yo, outside of this place it's very hot. Uh, so um, uh, I think you 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 got that word. Um <laughs> So what I was I was talking about the pushback. Pushback are one of these antelopes like the more or less the size of a uh, a female impala. Male have horns and the female don't have horns. I'd love to see them because it's been a while not seeing them in the in in this territory here. Because there's one in the DRC in the camp. It's always there. And lepers they also love to 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 hunt those antelopes. No birds, nothing. And I saw a Lavalian's cuckoo. But as you know, cuckoos they don't like being static all over the place. Fly here, fly there, looking for nests, laying eggs, everything. They are always busy. And it's been a while not having a, uh, a wild dog sighting. Ben is lucky today. Big up, Ben. No tracks. <sighs> Matomi, what is a lizard in my language? <laughs> oh, it's Pato. Yo, I didn't see that one coming. It's Patoa. That's uh, you call lizard. Like all the lizards. We call them Ispatoa. I S P H A D W A. Ispatoa. Oh, that's. It sounds hilarious, I know. It's so scary. Uh, I will, I will spend like five years teaching you my language because one of the difficult languages you find in, in, in you, know, you get in South Africa, Zulu is, uh, it's much better. Oh, we have a guy there who's who, who's trying to, uh, he's gone. We had a squirrel there, and he was running on these tracks, but he's gone. Sep, and you see that tree there over there. You see, see that tree. That tree, there's a, um, a genet that stays there. Um, I think we'll find one, this one, this jackalberry tree. Because all the time when I come past here, I see this genet there, sometimes hunting, sometimes jumping from one branch to another. Hopefully you will see that because there's a hole there. I think I'll go and check there. Maybe, maybe I, will, I will show you a genet. dry river beds. I can't wait to see water running down here. Yeah, it's been dry for a long time. Since I've been here, I've never seen water in this dry river bed. <sighs> yeah, here's this tree. Oh, in Johannesburg, they say it's raining cats and dogs. They are so lucky. They're very lucky. Hey. Uh, Mare just told me that here we are burning. We are burning. Uh, I can't see that one because they are more active during the night. <sighs> no bird, nothing. And I thought I would see an, an ool, you know, an ool. They love being in these places during the day. More especially, there's pearl spotted owlets, scorps owls. Giant eagle owls, nothing. And I haven't seen a nest for a while now. Because last time there's a, a dip not far away from here. Last time we were bumbling with uh, Lexi and, uh, and Rusty. We, we found Tandy just lying there. Maybe we'll, we'll, we'll be lucky to, to see her on the very same spot. There's this huge dip over here. And he was, she was lying on the left side here. 
Ah, nothing. See this dip? It's very cool down here. She was just here. And you know, Tandy, she's very grumpy. Uh, she did what she does best. <sighs> That's what she did. Oh, we have nice birds there. Hey, can you see them? Except, ah, oh, come on, we have a, there, here, there, there. Yeah, yeah. that's a hair milk. White crown, white crowned hammer, helmet shrike, yes. White crown hammer shrikes. These birds, they also, they also live in, in a group or in a flock. And uh, only two is uh, allowed to breed, like a dominant male and female, and then the others, they help raising the chicks. Great strategy. Look how beautiful that is then. Oh. Oh, they're gone. Just they. Oh, went to the other side, but I can't see them. Oh, buddy. White crown hammer shrikes. Yes, indeed. Uh, it is a beautiful bird. Uh, Marin FC is saying it's a beautiful bird. One of the best birds you can find. Color combination there, it's great. Very beautiful and pretty. Yeah, and there's this interesting thing I want to show you. Let me go back a little bit. I want to show you something interesting. This tree. I see this tree. It's this dead tree here. This tree will stand here for for many, many, many years to come. It's called a leadwood. These uh, these trees are known to to die. I mean, but they can stand for about 20, 30 years. And you can see their wood; it's still intact. Everything is in order because uh, this tree is. Is so strong to that point that a wood borer can't drill a hole in there. And that these trees that they they grow very slowly. Mm. Another interesting thing is that they used to do railway sleepers with this tree, very strong and they are waterproof. So for now, I'll be listening. Let's go to David in the Mara. Uh, thanks, Tori. I'm glad you're having a bit of good fortune there. Those white crested helmet trikes are very, very interesting birds to watch. Well, as you can see, not much has happened. The dogs have just put their ears up there. There's a, another vehicle just coming in, and as the tyres were crunching through the grass, that obviously attracted their attention because uh, it sounded potentially like uh, potential danger or food moving through the grass. That's why they popped their heads up. Um, one of the members has gotten up and uh, walked up the road a little bit. Uh, we actually just saw him stop in the bushes and do his ablutions, which is a bit better than the last one we saw. This one who's lying on the front left of your screen um, decided to just wee on itself earlier, which is something we see the hyenas do from time to time, and that is one of those things that doesn't really help with their somewhat pungent aroma that they have with their habit of lying in their own urine but smell is very very important to animals so it might s sound and smell pretty unpleasant to us but it is very important in terms of group bonding and group cohesion we just got a little whiff of that uh, very difficult to explain the smell of wild dogs to you guys they have a very specific smell um, but it's very difficult to talk about smell in general. Ah, I see our other pack member is on its way back. I say his, but I haven't actually, didn't actually have a look. Antoinette, you're asking why they're breathing so fast. Well, that's a very good question. Two reasons. Number one, they're hot. It is Africa after all, and it was in the low 30s this afternoon. So just like your domestic dogs do, they, they pant. 
and that's what we call evaporative cooling really uh, it's the same reason that when you sweat the wind blows across the uh, the moisture that is on your skin and that brings down your body temperature obviously dogs can't sweat through their fur uh, so they sweat through their tongue so by having their tongue open um, and panting heavily uh, then it cools down uh, the tongue through this mucous membrane but um, that's because of their hot but they're particularly breathing heavily at the moment because they've got such fat bellies uh, we uh, discovered a little bit earlier that they were able to steal an impala kill off a lone lioness apparently earlier today so they've got a full belly of impala um, so they are struggling a little bit they've eaten too much um, and the more oxygen you can get into your digestive system and the more carbon dioxide also that you can get into your stomach because that's important for creating stomach acid it just helps digestion occur quicker and now that they are they are static that digestive process can actually kick in and run to its uh, to its best abilities when they are on the move and moving around uh, the body's got a special adaptation to stop them from digesting food so that they can regurgitate that food to their pups or any other members of the pack who weren't there on the hunt or when the uh, the kill was made I'm not sure where that other one went. He certainly did go and uh, have a bathroom break and then came back, which was quite nice of him. Jennifer, you're asking if they make a kill every day. Well, they probably, obviously it's dependent upon what they kill, but um, it's quite normal for them to kill multiple animals in, in a day because they need a lot of food because they digest their food so quickly when they are stationary like this. Um, so we normally work on the basis of a pack this size is probably going to kill at least two impalas a day on average but obviously if they were able to take something larger down and with larger packs they are able to take bigger antelope perhaps even uh, wildebeest and young zebra for example out here um, maybe kudu or inyala that would be a good meal for them and obviously that would sustain them for a lot longer so I mentioned a little earlier um, whilst we were we were chatting that they, we reckon on average they probably eat about four kilograms of meat every day which is about a quarter of their body weight which is which is quite a lot if you think about it that way that would be the same as me I weigh probably about 85 kilograms so that's the equivalent of me eating 20 kilograms of food on a daily basis which as much as I would, might feel like it at times or might want to try I think I would struggle to put that much in Definitely just having a bit of a rest after a nice meal. Uh, Jacqueline, you're asking the average size of a pack. Well, from what I have seen, it, this is around about it, somewhere between sort of seven to ten adults. Obviously, if we've got this one at the front, looks like he's chasing flies. Um, I've got, um, oh, sorry, I've seen them yeah, around about sort of seven to ten on average, but if they do have pups, then obviously that number will increase. What often happens is that depend, it's going to be rather dependent on the resources in the area and the amount of competition, how many lions and hyenas there are, how much food availability it is, how large an area they have to traverse in order to find sufficient food. But most packs have a, um, a saturation point where they know that that's too many. And then what often happens is that members of the, the same sex, so usually brothers or sisters, will get together as a group and they will migrate the pack um, and then try and join a different pack, which helps for genetic diversity as well. Um, there have been reports, <laughs> these two playing at the back, uh, there have been reports of packs um, in the Kruger that have at times been up to 50 members. And then some of them sort of immigrate and emigrate and come back and, uh, and say hi to their old buddies. Uh, this one obviously got a little bit annoyed with that uh, goings on at the back and has shifted to a new spot. Uh, but speaking of genetic diversity, one of the things I haven't mentioned is that uh, ecologically, uh, an ecological role that wild dogs have in the system, because it seems thus far we've been talking about is how efficient hunters they are, um, but they do have an ability or they do have an effect on impala genetics as well, because as I'm sure you've seen, um, impalas do hang out in pretty big herds most of the time, um, and therefore they tend to stay together. Uh, but what dogs have a habit of doing is when they chase impalas, because they've got such stamina and they chase them uh, for, over such distances, those impalas get split up so much so that that original herd can't form and then those individuals sort of migrate into different herds 
um, and that helps to increase the genetic diversity within the impalas themselves. So it's not all negative impact that they can have. I think, oh, they've got a bit of playfulness going on now, and they do love playing, eh? they're active, even with full bellies, they're still gonna jump around. But you can see the submissive behavior. I'm just gonna stay quiet so we can hear the high-pitched chirpings that they make. very much uh, not dog noises that you would expect, very high-pitched, almost like bird-like squeaking. But lots of social interaction, very, very close-knit unit. And uh, are we going to get on the move? Yeah, but they all, they all, have, uh, all have their roles. Also known as the painted wolf. Lysenon pictus, which uh, sort of is their scientific name, uh, directly translated or, or from sort of Greek and Latin. Lysenon means wolf like, and pictus means painted, as you can see from those beautiful coats that they've got. So that's why they also, you might hear them referred to as painted wolves. moment of, uh, of activity. We've still got a couple at the back frolicking around, but although they're fairly stationary now. This one again has wandered off up the road. I'm, I'm, I think it's the same individual who keeps wandering up there and coming back. I'm obviously not sure which is the alphas uh, which aren't here, but possibly one of the youngsters that wants to move and the alphas are staying put. That's why this one keeps coming back, perhaps. on the tips of the tail there we've talked repeatedly about these following mechanisms that animals have so lions have got the black tuft uh, on the on the on the tip of their tail and uh, the black behind the ears leopards have got black behind the ears they've got white underneath the tail giraffe with um, white on the backs of their ears well the dogs are no different they've got they've they've got beautiful markings and all of them are completely unique just like our fingerprints but those tails have all got those white marks on the bottom and that is just that sort of social communication that they're able to follow when on the hunt. If they go into stalk mode, of course, just like most of the other cats and predators, they will hide those markings to not give themselves away. So they'll tuck their tail low uh, if they're trying to sneak up on something. But dog, uh, dogs generally don't do too much stealthy sneaking. They pretty much just uh, identify an individual um, and then they just start chasing. And they'll, they'll try and get reasonably close, but they almost form ranks in a line and then they just start jogging the predator, the, the prey sees them coming quite early on uh, and then the chase ensues and so when you can average a speed of around about 50 kilometers an hour for two, three, maybe even four kilometers before you get tired, that generally does spell curtains for whatever it is that is being pursued. Oh, this is so special, so special. Makes getting up at four o'clock in the morning every morning more than worth it. Eh? A small price to pay. The other one seems to have disappeared up the road and is now flopped down in the middle of the road, um, about 100 meters further up. A 
company asking how many kilometers they travel in a day when hunting well obviously it's fairly dependent on on how successful they are but quite a lot um, I can't give you a, a definitive answer but um, as from what I remember it's quite normal for them to cover 10 to 20 kilometers on any given day and if they are moving with purpose um, then perhaps as much or it has been recorded as much as 40 or 50 kilometers being covered in a day which sounds like a lot but believe it or not even something like a hippo when he comes out of water at night time to go and feed especially if the hippo's got to move far to find good grazing grounds in winter hippos have been recording recorded also moving as much as 40 kilometers in a night I've got a funny feeling one of the alphas might be the one behind these front two who's sort of twitching her ears. So center of the screen, the second one back with her head to one side at the moment. She just looks slightly bigger. She looks slightly bigger. The one behind this one at the front I think is probably one of the alphas. But the only way to be sure really is to watch the interaction. And it was all rather chaotic just now when they did interact and they disappeared into the into the long grass and I got very excited and really didn't concentrate on specifics. <laughs> Hello. I think they're looking at their friend up the road and wondering what uh, what it's doing up there. Maybe suggesting it might be time to get moving. This is the first time we've actually had a second one move. I've lost sight of the one who was slightly further up the road. I'm assuming he's gone further west along the uh, along Buffalo's sort of cut line here. Interesting to see if they come back or whether the whole pack follows in that direction. It looks like, I, actually looking at them, I swear they're less fat now than they were two hours ago when we saw them. Their digestion is so fast. Hello, are you coming to say hi? Yes, you must stay here. It's a nice place to be. We might be getting some action, obviously, just to just gonna be quiet for the interaction here. This is all happening about three meters from my feet. It's amazing. Yep, gorgeous light now as well. Blue me asking how fast can this one? He's got a mouthful of the other one's tail. <laughs> um, how fast can they run? Well, they can get up to 60, maybe even 70 kilometers an hour at a push. Um, but they're, what makes them so special is uh, their stamina, stamina and their ability to um, keep a constant speed of in sort of 45, maybe even 50 kilometers an hour over multiple kilometers, which is what makes them such efficient hunters. So much faster than you, that's for sure. Good rule of thumb out here everything can run faster than you out here that uh, that could potentially do you danger before somebody reminds me of a tortoise uh, of course but uh, generally not too scared of tortoises um, and i did have a question a little bit earlier about whether um, wild dogs are any danger to people um, i did check some reference material whilst you guys were away and i also i can't find any um, record of it and in fact most sources that I've got with me in the vehicle state that um, they are no particular danger to man so I've certainly never heard of anybody having an issue with dogs. One on the right um, just making some space after a big meal. 
Just have to reiterate again to anybody who's joined us a little bit later that this is our northern boundary road. So as they're walking up the road, if they turn to the right, unfortunately we won't be able to follow them, but we've had an absolutely spectacular sighting of them. Uh, obviously we're hoping that they turn left and they come on to Juma, and if we're lucky we'll pick them up tomorrow morning in the drone. That would be pretty amazing to see. But they do seem to be generally getting mobile now in a westerly direction along the road. So I'm just going to wait for this little greeting ceremony and then we're going to follow them, see where they head off. Okay, but whilst we figure out what they're up to, let's uh, send you back to Holly and see if he's had any luck with his leopard hunt. Ha! Huh. Nothing. Birds, they keep on flying off when I stop. Immediately when I see a bird, it flies off. Ah, and then we were discussing names. A Sepp was asking me like uh, animal names in my language. <laughs> and he was laughing at the back. <laughs> so, do you know a uh, daycare in my language? It's, it's, it's something interesting, daycare, a uh, frog and uh, a scrub hair. A taker, a common taker, it's a cleaner. Then a frog, it's koi koi. And then a um, scrub hair, unokwaja. Yeah, you have to write that down. <laughs> but I'll repeat those. Unokwaja. The squab here. A cleaner, common taker. Frog is quite And then a grasshopper, unontori. <laughs> ah, that one, it's, it's something else. Unontori. Sepp is busy laughing at the bank. <laughs> yes, yeah, so. I, uh, ah! I don't know where are these cats, so but I will, I'll be waiting for the sun to go down completely. So maybe we'll see all the interesting nocturnal stuff starting to be active. As you saw, those wild dogs are starting to to get ready, stretching and stretching. They will be moving because you know when the sun goes down, it's a magic hour. No tracks. The only tracks I've seen. Mobile and fresh hyenas. Those ones are all over the, the reserve. Huh. But I won't lose hope. We're going to find this. That's the western boundary and that's the northern boundary. So I'll be checking on the northern boundary and then I'll go to the west. There's a hook. Lady Macbeth, how do you write a click? Uh, a click is in my name, because my name you have to click before you say it. Oli. And it's, uh, it's so interesting because there's Q and there's X. In my language, uh, X is and then Q is then in Senzo's language, Zulu, X is, Q is, interesting. In Senzo's language, they will call me Oli. They call me Oli. And then in, uh, in my, in Senzo's language, if you put a Q there, it will be Oli, but with a Q. Not with X. It's very interesting. Language is something else here in South Africa. And I always like how David says it's jumbo jumbo everyone when, when he welcomes you all. And in my language I will say Lochani Noke. Lochani Noke means jumbo. Lochani Noke. Amazing. <whistles> you hear that bird call? It's a white proud scrub robin, but I can't find it. Oh, there's something happening. Wild dogs with Ben are on the move. Let's go and see them.
Hi guys, welcome back. Well, the dogs have got mobile and touch wood, fortunately for us, it looks as if they are coming south into Juma. Um, so we are, I've just come off the, uh, off our boundary road and they're sort of between our boundary and the firebreaker at the moment. Obviously they can change direction at any time, but as it stands, it looks like we're going to have them for a bit longer, which is amazing. And the light is absolutely beautiful at the moment. Let's just watch these incredible creatures and see what they're up to. I'm going to do my best to keep up with them, but they do move so fast um, that it's a good chance I won't be able to. But I'm hoping they're just going to find another spot and, and relax for a bit. some more popping out onto the road in front of us now. All right, Craig, I hope you've got your seatbelt on because we might have to pick up the pace in a second. Uh, Kilko, you would ask you about how far a, a member of the pack would go? Oof, uh, again, that's a, that's a good question. And the simple answer is, that I have to say, I don't know, probably, I don't see any reason why it would want to stray from the safety of the pack, uh, unless of course it's a, an animal that wants to emigrate from the pack because of uh, potentially to have the opportunity to get more mating rights, um, or because the pack has become so large. Oh, we've picked them up again on the fire break going west, fantastic. Um, so yeah, I don't really know. Uh, if they go and join another pack, of course they might emigrate to a very, very large another pack, but I don't know why they would just sort of wander off on their own for no apparent reason so sorry I can't give you a specific answer for that but I don't think far why would you say to have your friends right now it's going to be interesting they're like going left into the block right down the road fantastic and stay with them uh, right Craig you're going to have to help me out here what is this what road is this this is the top of Gary Cutland Vignola North. Sorry, viewers, I'm just going to check my map so I can let everybody know where we are going. Vignola Road North, right. Station Slummy Madutch has now gone south of Buffalo's Hook uh, cut line and is now momentarily static on Vignola Road North. It's just one on lock. Uh, sorry about that, just so you understand how it works out here, we, we do give periodic updates on the radio. All the vehicles in this area are in radio communication with each other. Um, and obviously it serves to uh, share information with each other because today we found the dogs and we've told everyone else about it and a few cars have come in and tomorrow it might be different. Maybe they find the lions or a leopard and they tell us and we have a chance to show you guys. What do you want? This guy's investigating our car. The one right in front of the vehicle. Hello. process what this strange green thing is that uh, makes funny noises and smells a bit unpleasant I would think. No, he's gonna block the road. Yes, I'd forgotten how beautiful these markings are. They really are spectacular. Everyone's slightly different. It's like a sort of a like Monet had a, had a go at watercolouring a, a domestic dog and came up with something like this. An impressionistic sort of uh, coat that they have. I wonder if they were going to go for water having such... Uh, big bellies, but I think they probably will have drunk already. They were quite close to uh, Buffalo's Hook Dam um, and they came off Torchwood, one of our neighbouring properties. As I would have thought that they would have eaten since they've uh, had this impala that they stole off the uh, off the lions. Um, because there is water closer by uh, where they could have gone to, but it seems like they're just uh, wandering off and exploring now. I wonder what the evening, what they've got planned for the evening. Maybe just trying to find a, 
a slightly safer spot to busy and uh, they can digest. But say so they, they can be active during the night, they're not strictly, strictly diurnal. I remember I worked in Tanzania for a while in a, a reserve called Katavi National Park, which is right down in the southwestern corner, uh, close to Salu and Ruaha, so about as far away from the Serengeti as you can get. Um, and we were actually lucky enough to see dogs there. And in fact, the only two times that I saw dogs whilst we were there um, was when we were driving back in the darkness. One of them was about two o'clock in the morning because we'd, uh, we'd had a bit of a breakdown on the way back from a town trip. And by the time we got it fixed, it was very late when we got back. But Lady Luck was shining on us. And obviously having sat at the side of the road for about five hours, uh, waiting for someone to come and fix our car, we were graced with uh, wild dogs on the way home. an incredible experience. Um, this is certainly, we're in wild Africa, but that was real wild Africa. I, basically my wife and I worked up at a, at a camp in Katavi for the best part of a year uh, where there was no power unless the generator was running, there was no cell phone signal, there was no running water, um, there was bucket showers that were scooped out of the river and heated up by a, a nice man who then poured it into another bucket and hoisted it up into the tree to give us water pressure. Uh, we had a long drop toilet, which was, uh, well, let's say freeing, shall we say, and lots of interesting uh, animal visits during the night. We had, we had leopards at one point, we had lions fighting outside the tent one time, elephant walking so close to the tent that the whole side of the tent was bowing in, uh, although we never did get to see dogs in camp. Just our resident hippo, hippo? Resident hippo Bubbles, who used to wander through every evening that we had to be careful of. And yes, she was called Bubbles because she farted a lot. <laughs> Just creeping forward a little bit. <laughs> it is an original name, yes, but it wasn't us who gave her the name. She was a bit of a, a star before we even arrived at, at that park. Looks like they're going to plonk themselves down in the road, possibly, uh, well, they've got lots of shade now. The sun is very low on the horizon. In fact, it's going to be sit setting very, very soon. Uh, unless you ask if they wag their tails in excitement. Well, I don't know whether it's exactly the same as your domestic dogs, but certainly the tail uh, is important for communication. It's a bit like ears and tails in all of our uh, cats and dogs out here are a good thing to, to look for. So I think, yes, when they are excited, they will wag the tail. Um, we had a little bit of an interaction earlier before. We actually had one, I'm not sure whether you saw it, one had clamped its jaws around the tail of another one and was sort of pulling it, so it almost becomes a bit of a play thing. Um, but I think it is fair to say that watching the, the dog's tails is a good indication of, of their mood, certainly. Do you see, Craig? I only see six at the moment. Are we missing two? Can you also see six? Yeah, so six. Craig's got a slightly higher vantage point than I have on the back of the vehicle, obviously, with the camera. Uh, but I'm sure they all moved in this direction, so maybe the other two are just around the corner. Well, it doesn't sound like Dolly's had any uh, fortune yet with his leopard hunt, but uh, still a little bit of time to go. So I'm going to try and sort of reiki some of my amazing fortune to find these guys in his direction. And let's see if that helps. So I'll send you over to Oli and see what he's doing. I'm racing to the hyena den because I haven't found anything and uh, I don't hear any, anything from the game drive radio, no cats in the property, only those wild dogs sighting. No hukumori, no fresh track, nothing. So hopefully the hyena will, will give us a very nice sighting there. And then we will be able to show the kids because it will be the kids, kids uh, drive. So, ha, it's that time of the day where we have to 
welcome kids but for you regular viewers i will see you tomorrow or we can continue watch the show until the school drives and that will be the end of the show so i'll be so some saying goodbye to you i'll see you tomorrow if possible